All right, this is the book of Ephesians, and we are in part eight. There's actually 10 parts, so we got two more parts to go. Um, starting out, as we always do, we're going to do some, some quick review of the books uh, of Ephesians. Again, it was written uh, by Apostle Paul between 60 and 62 AD. Then it was written while Paul was in prison. He also did uh, other letters to the churches that he helped establish, to the Philippians, the Colossians, and also to a friend of his, Philemon. City of Ephesus was an immoral, uh, decadent city, large port city, uh, dominated by both Roman and Greek cultures. In certain places, they clashed together. In certain places, they had a lot of similarities as well. But uh, it was more of that than there was of the gospel, and it wasn't really preached until uh, Paul came around and really started introducing Jesus Christ. You had Jews that were there, uh, but again, the, the, the influence is mostly Roman and Greek. Paul helped introduce uh, the mystery, Jesus Christ, the salvation for all, not just the Jews, but for everyone. Um, he helped establish this church uh, while he was on his third missionary journey. And he stayed in Ephesus for three years, building and starting this church. So he had a lot of work to do and a lot of people to help to uh, 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 minister to and to uh, reach for the kingdom of God. Uh, there was a lot of false teaching that was going on in the church after Paul left. Uh, so things, once he was there, it was strong. Once he left, uh, you had people starting to now come in and start to give false teachings and trying to bring back old ways and old theologies back into this church to split it up or whatever. So Paul had to write these, these, you know, these letters to them to refute some of that teaching and also encourage them to continue to believe. Uh, Books in Ephesians has several themes, so we want to make sure that we're keeping up with the themes of this. The mystery of the church is who is included in the church. Uh, Pre-Christ uh, um, um, or First Testament, you know, the Jews, it was, you know, they felt that everything was just for them. Uh, God only uh, uh, came to them. His word was only for them, but the mystery really was for the church is that he came for all, for God so loved the world. And uh, so he helped to uh, uh, introduce and dispel the thought of a mystery. It's no longer just for you, it's for all. Uh, we talked about the riches of God's people, the abundance of his riches that Christians possess but do not utilize. These riches are not just money, but it's also about all the things that he has given to us. We talked Sunday about the gifts of the Spirit. All of these are things that are riches to us that allow us to be able to do the work for the kingdom and to bless others as well as being blessed ourselves. We don't realize you know, how important it is that we utilize these, these things that God has given to us because he's given us power and he's given us authority. So there's abundance of riches that we need to seek out that God has given us and put them to work, put them to use. What good is money, money if you don't spend it? Ah, think about it. What good is there having all these things that God has given to you if you don't put them to work? I say it's just like a battery. If you got a battery and you just keep it in the box or keep it in the package but never bring it out and put it into you know, an apparatus so that it can be utilized, it's nothing. It does no good. Uh, and the church as a body. We're talking about the body of Christ. All things, we talked about that on Sunday, how so many things work together, the hands, the uh, the feet, the neck, uh, the arms, you know, each of us are part of the body. And that's what the church is. We're not talking about the, the uh, local assembly, but the whole body of Christ. And that is what the church is. Uh, we talked about unity uh, in faith, and with one another. We need to be unified in all that we do. As children of God, we are all uh, the same. We have one Father. The Bible says it's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. There's only one Holy Spirit. No one has any more Holy Spirit than the other. So we need to be utilized 
you know, and united in our thought process as far as reaching the world for the kingdom of God. No one is better than the other. Uh, you have some, and I say this even more of, of, of even myself, you know, I'm the pastor, I'm the shepherd, but I'm trying to get into heaven just like everybody else is. And I have to do the same thing that everyone has to do. Now, I'm a little bit more accountable because I know God has given me the, 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 the established uh, headship of this local assembly. But as far as I, I'm a shoe in, no. I, every day I got to still ask God to forgive me for something I've said or done. Uh, the first three chapters of Ephesians are doctrinal, and that is foundational teachings that help shape us and our Christian beliefs. What do we believe? Well, we believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross, was buried, resurrected, sits at the Father's side, and the Holy Spirit has been given to us to help us on our journey through this life and this new life we've been living. We believe that there's one Lord. Uh, 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 we believe in the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, but they're all one, all encapsulated together. These are the doctrinal parts of the first three chapters of Ephesians. And the last three chapters are practical, meaning basic instructions on how we shall live as children of God. How do we live? We know what we believe. Now, how do we live it? How do you live what you believe? We have to continue to do this day by day, constant. It's a constant work in progress for us to learn to live, believe, walk, and talk as children of God. So this is what Ephesians is about. And that's why I love this, this book so much because it really tells us everything that the word of God is trying to tell us that we need to do, what we need to have, who we are why we believe what we believe and why, you know, and how to live that life for God. Everything is encapsulated in six chapters of this book, and it is so poignant. So review, four things about Ephesians 5, 1 through 21. Uh, in Ephesians 5, 2, we talked about uh, we are to walk in love. Uh, five eight, we are to walk in light. Uh, five fifteen, we're to walk in wisdom. So we've got love, light, and wisdom. This is how this is how our walk is supposed to be. And then in verse seventeen, we are to be filled with the Spirit. We kind of talked about this last week. You know, being filled with the Spirit and possessing the Spirit are two different things. I can have uh, uh, matter of fact, I do. I've got I've got some clothes that's in my closet. I possess them. I have them. But if I don't wear them, if I don't put them to use, what good are they? They're just sitting in that closet. You can possess the Holy Spirit, but you're supposed to allow him access to help work through you. You have to operate in the Holy Spirit. You have to be filled with his spirit so that you can do the things he's telling you to do. It's to operate here on the earth. People say, and I, I, I know this, those that probably didn't turn me off, and they, oh, you need the Holy Spirit to go to heaven. That's not what the Holy Spirit is for. Holy Spirit's for you to work here on the earth. Now, it's a catalyst for you to make it into heaven, but just like that, that Adam said, you need the Holy Spirit to go to Walmart. <laughs> and you do. I'm a witness because I went and it wasn't no joke. But we have to be filled with the Spirit. So today's lesson, we're dealing in Ephesians 5, 22 through chapter 6, verse 4. So the rest of chapter 5 gives us a spiritual understanding of marriage and the roles of husbands and wives. And chapter 6 gives us a view of parenting and children from a spiritual perspective and the roles we play. Now, 
our churches are not all filled with married couples. We have single couples. We have uh, uh, single mothers. We have single fathers. Um, so all of this, you know, even though we may be centering mostly on the roles of husband and wives, we also need to deal with parenting and children, especially when it comes to children. We are all somebody's child. The Bible does not dictate children having a age parameter. If you've got a mother and father that is still alive, you still need to be and realize that you are still their child. And as we study about what the children are supposed to do, that's going to be centered on you if you're not married. So let's begin. This is Ephesians 5, 22 through 33. Then we'll go to uh, 6, uh, 1 through 4. I'll read the New King James Version. It says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church. And he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you, in particular, so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she represents her husband, respects her husband, I'm sorry. Then Ephesians 6, 1-4. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for it is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. So we started out with husbands and wives. We've ended up with children and parents. So if someone would, in the New Living Translation, Ephesians 5, 22 to 33. For wives, this means submit your, to your husbands as to the Lord. For a husband is the head of his wife, as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of his body, the church. As the church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. For husbands, this means love your wives, just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her, to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church, without a spot or wrinkle, or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. No one hates his own body, but feeds and cares for it, just as Christ cares for the church. And we are members of his body. As the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. This is a great mystery, but it is an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. So again, I say, each man must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Yeah. Somebody else read this, Ephesians 6, 1 through 4. 
children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord, for this is the right thing to do. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. If you honor your father and mother, things will go well for you, and you will have a long life on earth. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Rather, bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. Amen. Amen. So we've read all that. So let's just start this out in Ephesians 5, 22 to 24. That's only three verses. It talks about the wife. The primary emphasis for the wife is submission. Now, when you hear that word, most women cringe. And I think it's because they don't understand what the word of God is saying about this word submission. Submission does not mean subservient or substandard or inferior. We have to understand, we were made in his image, both men and women. When God created Adam, he created him a genius. God would not turn around and create Eve out of Adam and make her a dummy. No. She was just as wise as he was. They were made to work in unity. Okay? So what is submission? Well, according to the word of God, submission is a military term. Hapateso. That's in, that's the Greek. And it has to deal with alignment. Why you are to align yourself with your husband. The example was uh, Michelle, uh, and Michelle, this is, this is Michelle. Michelle put this together uh, at a different time. And when I did mine, it's like ours is just mirrored the same thing. And uh, we actually utilize this for our premarital counseling. I think I told you that before. But say, say, um, you have a car, and what, there's only one steering wheel. So especially when Michelle and I are out, I'm always driving. I, I just feel more comfortable driving. Michelle has to align herself with me and trust me enough to get in that car with me and know that I'm going to take us both safely where we need to go. She would not put her hands on the wheel. Well, I got my hands on the wheel. If I want to turn left and she wants to turn right, doesn't work that way. So we're talking about wives, you have to align yourself with your husband. Be willing to, to cooperate. Be willing to say, I trust you. I love you. I put my life in your hands. I agree, even if I disagree, I'm still going to agree enough to know that I'm gonna trust you to lead us in the way that you go. That's what Eve actually was supposed to do with Adam. It became a misalignment when she started listening to the snake, the serpent. She got out of alignment and therefore caused all of mankind to now be thrust into darkness. Chaos and death entered. So when we're talking about submission, it's not that you're taking a lowlier position, but that you're accepting and aligning and trusting your husband to do the right things. This is what I found so interesting. There is only three scriptures for the wife. Why is it to align themselves with the husband? To prevent power struggles. 
It's one of the biggest things that we have in marriages today is everybody wants to be in charge. God didn't plan on that. We are to work together. When spices, spouses align themselves together under God, they can then fight the real enemy, which is the devil, and not each other. We need to understand who the enemy is. A house divided against itself cannot stand, so the enemy's whole purpose is to destroy marriages, to destroy families, to destroy households by bringing up power struggle. Oh, I, I know what's best. I'm going to do it. And that's not how God planned this. But when we go to the husband, remember, the wife only got three scriptures. Me, we got nine. Y'all need them. Yeah. The husband got nine scriptures. He's really putting us in a position as men, as husbands, holding the bigger part of the responsibility. So here we go. For the husband, the role of the husband is to model godly love. Godly love, meaning we look beyond faults, we look beyond differences, and we see the need. And we step up to that need. Found in verses 25 to 28. Note, this type of love is sacrificial in nature. The love is measured in what he gives and not receives. One of the questions that we ask in our premarital counseling is, do you believe that marriage is 50-50? We, as of yet, have never had anybody say yes, because it's not. There's times when you're going to get, as a husband, you're going to give 90. Wives, there's times when you guys are going to give 95. Now, it'll balance, it should balance itself out, but it's not always 50-50. It's not a given, you know, I, I, I only do my part. And when I've done my little half, now it's up to you to do the rest. It doesn't work like that. It's sacrificial in nature. And we as husbands, we need to really understand that. We've been given a great responsibility to sacrifice ourselves for our mate. When the Bible says that the woman is the weaker vessel, you, didn't, you, you have to look at that. It's not, that doesn't mean uh, 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 docile. It means more sensitive. Our wives are our early radar system. Your wife is going to know that no good friend of yours before you know he's a no good friend. Amen. And it's the truth. I, I, at one time, I thought it was pretty bad. I'm like, man, why are you running off my one of these friends? No, nah, he really wasn't a friend. I couldn't see it, but my wife could. And there's things that she even sees now, so a lot of things I don't see but she'll steer me towards a truth and a light. And I love that about her because I know she's got my best interest at heart and I have to be man enough to say thank you for showing me, for giving me, for allowing me even opportunity to think I'm right, even if I ain't right. So how is a husband's love demonstrated? Paul uses verbs. He tells us to sanctify or set apart and cleanse the wife through the word. You need to know what the word says. Um, you want to know about your wife, uh, the type of wife you really need to have? Read Proverbs 31. That's an awesome woman. That's an awesome wife. She does a whole lot. And we need to make sure that we're setting her apart. We're setting her to a place to where of honor and blessings. And people see that. People know this is my wife. She's an awesome woman. She's an awesome lover. She's a great woman. She takes care of me. And God has blessed her. 
And that's how we cleanse our wives, through the word. He presents her to himself spotless. Doesn't mean you don't see the faults. But, it's, but it means that you even endear yourself to those things that you may not care for. But you know that they are things that make her who she is. I'm going to allow you to bless her and utilize her in the way God has made her. That's how you make her spotless. You are even endeared to the things that are different and they work. God would not put two people together that are just so alike because like pales, like poles repel. Opposites attract. Michelle and I have grown closer together, but when we started out, we we two different people, two different thought processes. And there's still things today that things she like, things I like, we don't like it out of each other. But we learn to live with that and it endears us to that and we learn how to look beyond that. And you know what type of woman you have and that's what love is about. Uh, just to love his wife as himself. I don't cuss my own self out. I would not cuss my wife out. I don't call my own self names. I sure wouldn't call my wife a name. I know what I like. I want to make sure my wife gets what she likes. So I have to treat her that way. I'm not going to down myself, so I sure can't down my wife. I have to raise her up as much as I want to be raised. I have to respect her as much as I need to be respected. He talks about nourishing and cherish his wife. Too many men look at their wives as a workhorse. You know, you've got to do this, you've got to do that, you know, make my dinner, wash my clothes, you know, do this, do that. Instead of taking the time to honor her, Mother's Day uh, is a once a year date. But Wives Day should be every day. We have to love, we have to cherish, we have to understand whom God has given us and make sure that we both nourish, which means to feed, to give, and to cherish. Know how important she is. Know how blessed you are to have her because she is your mate. Um, no, when husbands set the tone of the home, and the husband is supposed to set the tone of the home, with this kind of love, it makes it easier for the wife to align herself with him. That's what's so important. If we don't have, if we haven't set a tone in our homes that allows for there to be trust and love, a woman cannot align herself to us. She can't give herself to us because we've set a tone of mistrust. We've set a tone in our home of greed, uh, oneness, meaning when I say oneness, it's mine, me, all about me, it ain't about us. We set that type of tone. A woman cannot and will not align herself with us because there's no trust. There's no foundation. There's no ability to understand that we have their best interest at heart. So we got to set that tone in our home. We uh, also, too, uh, you have to make me happy. I got, yeah, 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 yeah. You got to make me happy. Please. I can do a lot of things. I cannot make Michelle happy. I can set a tone in the house that can foster happiness, but I can't make her happy. 
She can't make me happy. But, but when you're aligned, then it's all it's a, good balance. a great balance. It's a good balance. There we go. And happiness will come. Happiness will come. Trust will come. Blessings will come. Uh, Ephesians five thirty two, the great mystery of marriage, and this is what the this is this is um, the scripture that we read. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Marriage is not about a physical husband and wife, where Christ is concerned. Uh, a physical husband and wife represent the ultimate marriage between Jesus Christ and the church. Christ is the groom and the church is the bride. That is why same-sex marriages do not work. Christ cannot marry himself. He must have a bride. The bride is the church. He is the groom. That is how he set up the whole institution of marriage. We as we we as physical, we are to follow that pattern of Christ and the church. The ultimate goal for marriage is for people to look at the two spouses and see how much Christ loves the church and vice versa. This is evangelistic in nature. When they see a thriving, blessed, prosperous marriage between a man and a woman, that is how they should see how much Christ loves the church. Because it's a sacrifice, it's a union, it's an alignment, there's blessings, there's prosperity, there's greatness, and then there's offspring that come from that, that passes down from generation to generation and allows for there to be harmony, love, faith, and trust. So the two biggest needs for a husband and wife found in Ephesians 5.33, for a woman to feel loved, she, in most cases, needs emotional stability and security in the marriage. She has to be able to know she can trust her husband with her life. Michelle tells the story, and it's so true. She called me one day and told me that she had gotten this bonus at work. And I'm like, oh, woo, thank you. That, that'll work. We, we have money. Michelle says that, uh, uh, tell the story. Well, one of the girls that overheard that, and I think I've heard, you've heard the story before, she said that was my money, and that was my blow money, and you don't have to share it. And she, uh, she was single, but living with somebody. Good. And it's like, I trust Malcolm with the money, our money is married. It's, and then to take a step further, our cell phones are married. Mm -hmm. We know each other's codes to get in and out of each other's cell phones. We share the same program, so whenever she makes a call, it shows up on my history, same vice versa. I make a call, it shows up on her history. And We have got nothing to hide from one another. And a lot of the people think that that's crazy because it's supposed to be private. And what the guy gave to me to say to her, uh, you can go to sleep every night with this man and trust him with your life, but you can't trust him with your money. That's a problem. Yep. That's a problem. That's a big one. It's a big one. And then for a man to feel loved, he, in most cases, needs to feel respected in the marriage. And there's things that we need to do in order to make sure we are respected. Meaning we treat our wives right. We treat our families right. We communicate. We take care of the house. We make sure that, you know, bills are paid. 
you know, we make sure that food is in the house. We got, you know, with the things we got to do to make that happen. We don't just leave things to chance and happenstance. We don't try to run games and play games. We, as men, as husbands, in order for us to feel respected, we've got to lay a foundation in our home and set that tone in our home for respect. When that happens, we we can be respected. And women, as wives, you mean your husband, and it's just little things. Um, it's not funny, or I can't joke joke about Malcolm because I love being married, and there's still boundary issues there. I can get as mad as I want at Malcolm. I've got a little war with him at church, mm -hmm. but nobody will know that. Mm -hmm. But honey, when we get home, we have we high level discussions, and some discussions are a higher level. We don't we don't fight. We just, don't fight. We just high, high level, level discussions. discussions. <laughs> 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 And I'm sure y'all have high level discussions too. Some a little higher. Some than high level, level, some some a little higher than that. <laughs> yeah. But we still make sure that, that that we respect, 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 respect one another. Yeah. Got to. And that's how we feel the love. Is when we know that we have the respect of our wives and our families. So let's go into children, Ephesians 6, 1 through 3. Children are to obey their parents. Good, bad, or indifferent. That's a hard one. That's a hard one. But children are to, mm -hmm. according to the word of God, they're to obey. I can remember as a child doing something, and I knew it was disobedience, and my parents used to quote, the scripture at me, and I, I really never knew what it meant. But see, they would quote the scripture, you know, it's, 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 it's better to obey than sell us. Obedience is better than sacrifice. And I'm, you know, I'm as a kid, I'm like, <laughs> I, I, ain't, I don't know what you're talking about. To obey is better than sacrifice. And they, they would throw that at us in a heartbeat. And I, I, I knew I was going to whoop him because <laughs> I didn't obey, but I never knew what that meant until I got older and I started reading the word. And I read about Saul, who was told to destroy everything, kill everything, kill them. The, the men, the women, the children, the cattle, the dogs, anything that breathes, kill it all. And what did Saul do? He kept back some of the good sheep. Some of the good stuff. Some of the good stuff. <laughs> to where Samuel came and had to tell him, well, you know, what'd you do? Saul said, I did exactly what you said. Well, you so Saul and Samuel goes, well, what is this bleeding in my ear? Meaning, I hear the sheep. <laughs> I hear What's that like here? Don't be lying to me. I, I hear him. What's this bleeding I hear in my ear? God's taking this away from you because you were disobedient. And you want to say that you saved the best for sacrifice. No, obedience is better than sacrifice. And that's what we were told. So what the time I got older that I understood that. And it's true. Children are to obey their parents. Why? Because the blessing of obedience gives inner peace and long life. This is the promise. Now, there's a slippery slope with this. And we're going to get into more of this when we get into parenting, which is what I think I should do first before I get back into that. Let's go parenting. Do not provoke your children to wrath or anger. Bring them up to fear and reverence the Lord. Lead by example. That's what we as parents are to do with our children. So when I, when I thought about that, children, about obeying your parents, if you know your parents is telling you to do something that you know is downright wrong, illegal, teaching your kids how to shoplift, 
Yeah. That's that's hard. You can't obey that. That goes that that's put back on the parents. Number one, you're provoking your child to wrath and anger. You're telling them to sin. You're showing them how to sin. You're not bringing them up in the reverence and the fear of the Lord. You're not leading by an example of what you're supposed to do as a good parent. You're teaching that child all the wrong things to do. Amen. And that is wrong. You have a lot of that happening. That does not that does not lead to long life and inner peace for a child or the parent. When you abuse your children, abused children grow up to abuse children. And that is that's a fact. We have to do the things as parents. I was, I was driving, I was driving, I think it was one day last week, and I don't know why I thought about this, but I saw so many people, everybody I looked at, the first thing that came to my mind was, everybody on the earth has a mother. Everybody. Everybody mm -hmm. has a mother. Now, whether they were a good mother or a bad mother, every human being came from a mother. Mm -hmm. And we have to understand that God's provision for us is that we obey not just him, but his word and our parents. My parent, both of my parents have passed. Both of Michelle's parents have passed. But there are still things that was taught to me that I still have to honor the name of my parent. Because mm. it's still there. There's still ways I cannot act because they are not here. That's honoring them. You were trained better. I was trained better. I knew better. Mm -hmm. So I still have to honor my parents, whether they're here or not. Mm -hmm. And we wonder why a lot of our children die young mm -hmm. or go through bad times. A lot of that has to do with it's twofold. The parents provoking their children to anger and wrath and not giving them the reverential fear of the Lord. And two, the children just plain old being disobedient and don't care. If I I mean, look, look, let me tell you something. If I thought not even acted. If I, if it just came into my mind to call my mother a B, mm. I would not be here today. What? Yeah. <laughs> yes, you, got, you got these kids calling their mothers and oh. fathers all kinds of names. Mm. I thought about it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Man, look, mm -hmm. I would. I did my, my look, my mother did something to me once. We lived out in the country and we had a big, huge mound of dirt. Now, there's three boys, no girls. I had no sisters. There's three of us. But I was the one that had to go out there and dig in that mound all the time. And I got out of school, I had to go, two things I had to do I had to peel potatoes and dig dirt. <laughs> <laughs> Those two things I had to do when I lived out in the country. Peel potatoes and be... He just, he just laughed at you. Billy knows. Billy knows. <laughs> Billy knows. You remember that big mound of dirt back there, don't you, Billy? Yeah. I, I know he does. <laughs> well, one day, I just got fed up with digging this dirt. And I'm standing out there by myself just fussing. I ain't think nothing. <laughs> 
I'm just ah, and my mother heard me. And he said, he said you had a fit. Yeah, I had a fit. <laughs> <laughs> so y'all don't understand. Billy used to live across the street from us. It was me and Billy. We grew up out across the street from us. And my mother said something mm -hmm. and walked away. Well, there was a lawn chair there. And I, and I thought about throwing it at my mother. And my father came out that back door and looked at me. He didn't say a word. He just looked at me because he knew what I was saying. Yeah. <laughs> Honey, listen. <laughs> That chair stayed right where it was. I picked up my shovel and went back to digging dirt. Mm -hmm. I went back to digging dirt. <laughs> just a thought. <laughs> just the thought of me throwing that chair at my mother. You read your he read me, boy. I didn't say a word, but he gave me a look that said, I will kill you and make another one look just like you. Well, <laughs> Amen. Amen. Fear. Fear. That's fear. Fear, Lord. Amen. But that's how it goes. You know, we have to. We, we have to. It's twofold. If we want our children. Thank God you didn't throw through that chair, honey. Look, I wouldn't be here today, or I'd be crippled. No. I'd be crippled because I he, he broke my arm and my legs and everything else. I'd be sipping all my food. Blind, crippled, and crazy. Oh yeah, man! I'd be. Oh, yeah. I'd have had I'd have blended steak because I wouldn't have no teeth. <coughs> oh yeah, man! Ain't no joke. But if we want our children to obey us, if we want our children to have a long life, we've got to also. Treat them doesn't mean we don't discipline them. When we discipline them, we have to discipline them in love. That's one thing I can truly say about my father. When, when it came to disciplining us, he never did it when he was angry. He always, you know, it was always, always that wait till your father gets home. Well, he'd come home from work. I would tell him, tell him what he what we did. And my father would, okay. And he he didn't say nothing. He just came in. Went to pray, had his dinner, whole evening go by, which I thought was really cruel, really. He let us go to bed. Mm. Then he came and woke us up. <laughs> and then you got your punishment. There ain't nothing like being woke up and getting a whooping. <laughs> and I thought it was cruel, but my father had to have time to calm down and decompress give you your lecture as to why he's about to do to you what he has to do to you. Because it's to correct you and get you right on the pathway. So that's what that is about. We need to make sure that even when we're disciplining our children, that we do it in love, we do it for the right reasons, just like God does for us. He'll discipline us, but he doesn't do us that he doesn't discipline us because he hates us. He disciplines us because he loves us and he wants to do things right. And that's how we are to treat our children. So our closing points for today. A wife's primary responsibility is submission or alignment with her husband. A husband's primary responsibility is demonstrating godly love through sacrifice. Children are to obey their parents in order to receive inner peace and long life. And parents are not to aggravate their children, but raise them to love God. That's what we talked about today. Are there any questions? Any comments? Any experiences? Thank God for all of it. Yeah. Thank God for all of it. He said. Thank God for all of it. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Well, what was that? The next lesson, I want you to read Ephesians 6, 5 through 13. 